Raise your hands if you loved math in school. All right, y'all are dorks. Just kidding, I love you guys. Math was not my forte. I did it because I had to. Um, and I can successfully say that I never use it ever now. It's wonderful. I just open the Bible and the Bible tells me everything. But anyway, in, in, in math, you love the equations that are plus, minus, divided by, or multiplied by zero. You always know where that's going. I mean, those are just the easiest ones. Whenever zero is in the equation, you're like, oh, I got this. I'm, I may miss every other line in this whole thing, but I'm going to get that one. And this morning, we got to do a little bit of math when we talk about salvation. But it's easy and it's wonderful. And this morning, we're going to be talking, especially in, in Bob's part of this sermon, salvation is grace plus nothing. Grace plus nothing. There's, you know, in, in Isaiah 64, he says, God, all my good deeds in the, in the realm of salvation are just like filthy rags. They're worthless. It is your grace that saves me. And Paul would say, it is by grace that we are saved, not by works, so that no one can boast. And yet later on in, 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 in 1 Corinthians, he says, yet if I do boast, I will boast in the Lord. So let's stand this morning, let's pray, and let's thank him for his salvation. Jesus, thank you so much for your grace. Lord, thank you so much that you love us with an incredible love that we can't comprehend, Lord God, but let us say yes to it, Lord. Let us hold on to it and derive all of our life from it, Lord. Thank you for your love. Thank you for your tender mercy. Work in us, move in us today, and be glorified. It's in your name we pray, Lord. Amen. I am poor. I am spent. I am filled with much regret from what I have done, from where I have come, that what I owe is above my head, that my account has nothing left, but my
Gracious God, how good it is to be in your house today, in our Father's house. On Father's Day, God, we love you and praise you and lift you high today. I pray, God, that you would indwell this place, that you would indwell these people, God, that you would bless them in ways perhaps they've never had before. I pray your presence here, Father. I pray that you would be lifted high here, and we give it all to you in Jesus' name. So you may take the next little bit of time and either go to the front or the back and give your offering. Um, make sure to send your kids down front for the children's message. And happy Father's Day. Take a minute and greet someone and tell them happy Father's Day. And good morning and happy Father's Day to you who are watching us online. We're so glad that you are. If we haven't met yet, I am Pastor Bob Thompson. And uh, it's my privilege to greet those of you especially who are in live stream. My day began this morning with Psalm 150, which begins and ends with praise the Lord. And then it continues, praise God in his sanctuary. So where is God's sanctuary? It's wherever his people are, wherever you are. Praise him for his mighty acts. Don't just watch the live stream. Join us as we sing and pray and hear God's word. Thanks for being here.
very good. I was hoping we would have more than just you. I mean, you're wonderful, but now we have more friends, and that's great. Do any of you guys know what day today is? Father's Day, that's right. And I want to talk about Father's Day because it's a special day. So do any of you have anything that you learned maybe from your dad or your grandpa or an uncle? What have you learned from them? A song from my uncle. Your uncle taught you a song. What about you guys? Has your dad taught you anything? You don't know? Work harder. Knox? Knox. Your dad teaches you about outdoor stuff, right? I've seen him teach you all about trees and leaves. Well, I want to tell you guys a little bit about my dad this Father's Day. So I went around my house and I picked up a bunch of things that remind me of my dad. So here's the first thing I picked up. What did I grab? A tennis racket. Will you hold that for me, please? That's because when I was about your age, my dad started teaching me how to play tennis. And then when I got a little bit older, what did I bring next? Really? Nobody? Wow, they are growing up a calculator. Oh, you can hold that. Thank you. Because Pastor Paul, sometimes pastors do learn math. And my dad's really good at math, so he taught me how to do math. And then when I got a little bit older, he started teaching me how to make puzzles, because my dad's really good at puzzles. Can you hold on to my puzzle for me? Thank you so much. This is going to be the scariest one. And then when I got even older than that, car keys. My dad taught me how to drive. Will you hold that and promise not to steal my car? Thank you so much. But all during that, there was another thing my dad was busy teaching me. What book did I bring with me? The Bible. That's because my dad was really busy making sure that I knew two things. One was his favorite Bible verse, which goes, Honor your father and your mother, that your days may be long in the land that the Lord your God gives you. And the other is that my dad was busy making sure that I knew that God is our father. And so he wanted to make sure that I knew all the stuff that God teaches us in the Bible, like how to love people and how to be kind to people, to do things for others who might need our help. So my dad was busy teaching me all of that. So I want to give you guys a job today. Are you guys ready for a job? Okay, for Father's Day, I want you to find a dad. It could be your dad. It could be a friend's dad. It could be your granddad. Anybody's dad works. And when you see them doing something that looks like something God would do, like teaching somebody something, or taking care of somebody, or just being kind and helping somebody, I want you to go give them like a high five or a big hug or something and say, you're a great dad. Do you think you can find a dad and catch him in the act of being a great dad today? They look skeptical. Step up your games, dads. All right. Dads, your job is to get caught in the act. Kids, your job is to find a dad who's being awesome today, okay? Let's pray for them. God, thank you so much that you put so many wonderful dads on the earth, and we thank you that you are teaching them how to be more and more like you so that they can teach us how to be more and more like you. We pray that you would help these kids to look for really awesome examples of dads being great and that we would celebrate them and celebrate you through them today. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Can I have all my stuff back? It is a blessing to have dads today, and your order of worship may say one thing, but we're going to switch it. Would you join me as we have our Father's Day blessing? God, our holy and eternal Father, we thank you and praise you this Father's Day for the fathers you have placed in our lives. For fathers who work tirelessly to balance the demands of work, marriage, and children, and the people said. For fathers who are striving to become worthy and virtuous leaders. For fathers who have painful relationships with their children and are working and praying for forgiveness, healing, and restoration. For stepfathers and adoptive fathers who freely choose the obligation of fatherhood. For the men who are about to become fathers who anticipate the delight of their children. For the fathers who have lost a child to death yet continue to hold their children forever in their hearts. For the men who have no children but cherish the next generation as if they were their own. 
and for the fathers who are no longer with us but live on in our memory and whose love continues to nurture us. We praise you for all the men together. We praise you for all the men who have fathered us in their roles as mentors and guides. We thank you, God, for designing men to be a reflection of your fatherly heart and for giving them courage and strength, kindness and patience. Enable them to be godly leaders for their families and faithful witnesses to your love. We pray for you to continue refining them so that they would reflect your image more and more perfectly. Amen. Happy Father's Day, gentlemen. Thank you, Lori, and welcome to Corinth. Uh, don't forget to sign that friendship pad that's located close to the center aisle. If you are new to Corinth and haven't ever received one of our little welcome folders, we do have some greeters, and uh, they'll be in the outside aisle, I think, or if they're not, oh, here they come. Uh, here comes Patter, so if you're, uh, if you're a guest, just lift your hand and let Patter see it. She's in the center aisle, and uh, that's a little bit more information about us. Happy birthday to Harold Hewitt, who is turning 94 on June 23. There's a special Father's Day concert here in our sanctuary today. You'll see information about that in your bulletin. Otherwise, Corinth kids, who are our elementary age kids, and Corinth youth, middle and high school, are going to camps this week. And you'll see information about that, so please remember them and their leaders as they learn more about Jesus. So here's something different this summer. Uh, for the next three weeks, there are going to be combined services at 8.30 and 11 o'clock here in the sanctuary. The reason is some of our staff are coming and going. I'll tell you a little bit about where I'm going to be for the next couple of weeks, but Paul and Kevin will have a message next week. Paul and Amy the following week. I'll be back the third week, which is July 10th. So all of those services, both at 8.30 and 11 o'clock, will be here in the sanctuary. Otherwise, uh, please check the bulletin for even more opportunities to connect and serve. Maybe I should mention that next week is Children's Sunday, so that's part of our preparation for VBS as well. It's going to be a very special Sunday. I believe those are all my reminders. Uh, if you notice that I'm dressed a little differently than I usually am at 830, it's because we're going to confirm two of our young people today who were not able to be with us a couple of weeks ago for our confirmation service. So we look forward to that as part of our 830 worship this morning. So let's turn our attention now to the reading of the Word of God from the 8th chapter of Hebrews. Uh, if, uh, you know that Hebrews is about 13 chapters. That means we're a little over halfway uh, in this remarkable part of our New Testament. Hebrews chapter 8, beginning with verse 1. Now the main point of what we are saying is this. We do have such a high priest who sat down at the right hand of the throne of majesty in heaven, and who serves in the sanctuary, the true tabernacle set up by the Lord, not by a mere human being. Every high priest is appointed to offer both gifts and sacrifices, and so it was necessary for this one also to have something to offer. If he were on earth, he would not be a priest, for there are already priests who offer the gifts prescribed by the law. They serve at a sanctuary that is a copy and shadow of what is in heaven. This is why Moses was warned when he was about to build the tabernacle, see to it that you make everything according to the pattern shown you on the mountain. But in fact, the ministry Jesus has received is as superior to theirs as the covenant of which he is mediator is superior to the old one, since the new covenant is established on better promises. For if there had been nothing wrong with that first covenant, no place would have been sought for another. But God found fault with the people and said, The days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the people of Israel and with the people of Judah. It will not be like the covenant with, I made with their ancestors when I took them by the hand to lead them out of Egypt, because they did not remain faithful to my covenant, and I turned away from them, declares the Lord. This is the covenant I will establish with the people of Israel after that time, declares the Lord. I will put my laws in their minds, I will write them on their hearts, I will be their God, and they will be my people. No longer will they teach their neighbor or say to one another, Know the Lord, because they will all know me, from the least of them to the greatest. For I will forgive their wickedness, 
and remember their sins no more. By calling this covenant new, he has made the first one obsolete, and what is obsolete and outdated will soon disappear. The word of God for the people of God. The sermon title today is drawn from my favorite passage in the Old Testament, which must have been one of the writer of Hebrews' favorite passages because he quotes it at such length. So if you didn't notice, about half of that reading today was quoted from the book of Jeremiah. It was in direct quotes there, and my favorite line is this one here, I will remember their sins no more. I really don't want you to miss that today. If you're thinking about something else, think about this and read it with me. I will remember their sins no more. I want a little bit more emphasis here, like a Pastor Paul, before the service, prayed for passion and excitement in the service today. Let me hear passion and excitement. Do it again. I will remember their sins no more. I want you to see that today. And seeing is very important to this week because of this next slide. So you may notice on the uh, prayer list that Pastor Bob is having surgery this week. And I just want to sort of let you know it's not cancer or anything seriously. Basically, according to the eye doctor, I look like the guy on the left here, and uh, my eyes are getting narrower and narrower, so after my surgery, I'm going to look more like the guy on the right. My eyes will be wider open, I will be able to smile again, and I will have a larger nose. (laughs) Now, I have to disappear for a couple of weeks after this surgery, and this next slide is a little bit scary, so just brace yourself, because this is what I'm going to look like immediately after surgery. That was funny, why didn't you laugh? Like, okay, so uh, yeah, I'm gonna have black and blue eyes for a little while and it's not very appealing to be in front of people. So uh, anyway, uh, the, the point is, I want you to see this today and seeing is very important for me. So the reason I'm having this surgery is because the doctor says I can see less and less than I used to be able to see and he wants to open my eyes. So today my goal is to open your eyes to what the writer of Hebrews, and if you've been here, you know that I like to call him Barney just because I like the name and because it was my grandfather's name and because it's short for Barnabas, who's one of the best theories about uh, who wrote Hebrews. And I don't like to keep saying the writer of Hebrews, the writer of Hebrews. So when I talk about Barney, I'm talking about the anonymous writer of what we know as the letter to or maybe the sermon to Hebrews. My part is to give you a brief overview of the text, and then Pastor Paul is going to come with a little bit of uh, application for us. So I want you to see three aspects of this text. First of all, I want you to see the point. And this is how Barney starts chapter 8. He says, now the main point of what we are saying is this. So this is a pivotal verse in Hebrews. If you haven't gotten anything else in Hebrews, if uh, if you don't get anything else after this, or you just want, what's the central verse in Hebrews? This is it, right here. So pay attention. I want you to see this. This is the point that he wants to make. So this is the main point. And that word main point can also mean a summary, or it can mean the crowning affirmation. In other words, all of Hebrews is sort of drawing up toward one point. So there's a, there's a dual use of this word here. I want you to see the point. This is the highlight of the book of Hebrews. This is what he's really trying to get you to say. So what is it exactly that he wants you to get? And his words are that you, we do have a high priest Such a high priest, he says. Now, when he says that, he's going back to chapter 7, which I don't have a lot of time to go back and review. But in chapter 7, he talks about the kind of high priest that we need. We need a high priest who meets our need because he's a permanent high priest. And that's unlike the other priests that the Old Testament talks about. And so the high point of this text is we have such a high priest who doesn't die. He doesn't fade away. He doesn't change. He is a permanent priest. And because he's a permanent priest in the heaven, at the seated at the right hand of the Father, his, the idea that he's sitting down, no high priest in the Old Testament ever sat down while he did his job. He was always standing when he was offering the sacrifices. But this high priest, he sat down because the job is done. And the job that is done is declaring that you can be part of God's family because he's done everything necessary for that. And 
the, uh, and, and Barney continues, therefore he's able to help those because he's always living, he doesn't die, he's always living to intercede for us. That he's, he's, he's always got your back. When you belong to Jesus, you have someone who always, in the presence of the Father, is seated down because the work has been done to declare you fully righteous. That's what Barney wants you to see. And we have that kind of high priest. We don't have to worry that he's going to fade away or go away or get busy doing something else. The work has already been done. So second, Barney wants you to see in this text the preview, because for those to whom Barney is writing, and he's writing to people who were Jewish by birth, to them there were whole sets, uh, a whole set of visuals, and uh, at points the Old Testament is very visual. I've been reading the part of the Bible on which uh, this, uh, the, the background, the preview is based. It's the last 15 chapters of Exodus. And I know some of you who are holier than I am love to read the last 15 chapters of Exodus and see those marvelous parallels between the tabernacle and, uh, and the gospel. And honestly, it's wonderful. I want to hear somebody else talk about it. It's amazing. But for me, it's just really laborious. There are so many details about the length of this and the kind of material to use for that and the wood over here and the, what the priest wore and all the little stones on his vestment, and there's all this stuff, and I'm going like, can we get on to this? But this is what Barney's talking about. He said, it's such a visual thing. And when you think about priests and law and gifts they had to offer, and a sanctuary, and a tabernacle, and a pattern, all of that was preview. Don't get stuck on the preview, he says. Don't return to the preview because your faith is so weak that you need something tangible. Instead, he says, listen, all of that is a copy and a shadow. And if it's a copy, there has to be an original. The original is the center of our faith. And if there's a shadow, there has to be a reality. So most of us don't talk about priests most of the time. So I was trying to think of what would, what would be a great parallel. And I thought of electric football, which is exactly what everybody else went to as well, right? So this was really popular in the 70s before video games and all that kind of stuff. And you just set up your little football players on the board and you turned a switch and they all vibrated and you, decide, and you saw whether your people actually went where you intended for them to go. So let me ask you this. Can you learn anything about football from playing electric football? Yes, you can learn there's an offense and a defense. You can learn there are 11 players on both sides. You can learn that positioning is important, that strategy is important. You can learn about yardage, how many yards to go and how long it takes to get to the end zone and how many points you get when you get in the end zone. But once you've seen a real football game or once you've played in a real football game, does the copy hold the same kind of attraction? Absolutely not. You're going, I know what real football is. That was just a preview. And this is Barney's point in Hebrews chapter 8. So he wants you to see the point, and he wants you to see the preview, and third, he wants you to see the promises. So there's another visual, and he wants you to open your eyes wider to let light in and see what Barney wants you to see here. And he, he goes back to Jeremiah's quote. So again, he's going back hundreds of years before Jesus, and he says, let me tell you about the new covenant. Now, there are times that I see something that either I've seen for the first time or I forgot it. The latter is probably the case when you get to be my age, but there was something I read this week in a commentary about the word covenant that I never remember seeing before. So bear with me for just a brief moment for a little technical explanation. There are two Greek words for covenant, and one of them is more like a contract. Two parties are involved. Both parties have to sign. They both have to agree to a deal. The second word is more like a last will and testament. Now let me ask you a minute. Just hold on for a minute because you never thought about this before. When we describe the two parts of the Bible, do we call it an old contract and a new contract? No, it's an Old Testament and a New Testament. And the difference between a contract and a last will and testament is there's only one responsible party for the last will and testament. One person makes the will. Now, that person may get you involved in the process and say, I'm trying to figure out how to divvy up my stuff. But basically, the, the testator makes the will, decides what to do with all of his or her stuff. 
And if you are one of the recipients or you're not, you don't really get a say. So the person who makes the will and testament is in charge of it. That's the Greek word that is used all the way through the New Testament for the idea of a covenant. It's not like you and God have a deal. It's that God says, this is how it's going to be. And you're going to fulfill what I tell you to do. So in the Old Testament, there were all these laws and sacrifices and details and festivals. And God's saying, like, you need to do this if you want to be part of my family. Now God has made a new testament, a new last will and testament. And he has died in order to make the last will and testament effective. And this is what he wants you to know about the new covenant. So see these promises. I will put my laws in their minds and write them on their hearts. In other words, it's going to come from within you. He's talking about the Holy Spirit spirit without naming him. I will be their God and they will be my people. It's going to be about relationship. You're going to know me. You're going to have an intimacy with me. And then, verse 12, I will forgive their wickedness and remember their sins no more. So the difference between the two testaments is not that in one testament people sin and the other testament they don't. It isn't that in one uh, in one contract there are two parties and the second there is one. No, there's one party who has told you this is how the testament works. And you know how the New Testament works? You're still just as screwed up as they ever will, but I'm going to forget about that. I'm going to choose to treat you like you have never sinned. That's the New Testament and God's the one who made the rules and Barney wants you to see that. I can tell you that in my ministry are there risks about preaching gospel only? There absolutely are. Are there other passages of of Scripture we can point to? Are there other things Hebrews says? Absolutely there are. We're going to come to them. But on this day, I want you to see this. I will remember their sins no more, period. That's the New Testament. That's the New Covenant. That's the New Deal that God has made. And it's what Barney wants you to see today. And I can tell you, as a pastor, I am all in on this. And I'm all in because I know me and I know how much I need for God to pour grace into me. But I'm also all in because I know you. And I know your stories. And I see your blind spots the same way you see mine. And I see the ways that you turn away and are unfaithful to God because I see my own. And I choose to see you through grace. I'm all in on this. There are two times, and I need to turn this over to Pastor Paul, but there are two times in particular when you'll hear the all-in on grace from me. And one time is during a funeral. I don't know if you thought about what it's like to preach a funeral for people that were not all that interested in God or in church all their lives. I still preach grace at every single funeral. Unless the person specifically said, I'm, like, I'm not a believer in Jesus, that's a different thing. I'm not going to pretend they had a faith but I'm not preaching a funeral and going, this person had a lot more reason for me to believe in grace than that person. Funerals bring out the grace in me because I am all in on this. If I don't believe in grace that God will not remember our sins no more, I shouldn't even be a pastor. And the other time is confirmation. Not making exactly the same comparison, guys, but... So after 30 years, I have realized there is a, there is a wide gap uh, between how some 12-year-olds embrace their faith and where they are 10 or 20 or 30 years later. That's not my job, to figure out who's all in, who's real, who's really trusted Jesus. It is my job to preach the gospel. It is my job to ask them to embrace the gospel. It is my job to make sure that they never say later on down the road, you know, I never heard that whole thing about how Jesus will remember our sins no more. So the two confirmands that are going to be confirmed today, I'm just going to give you a brief excerpt from their faith statement. And this is, in some level, this is what I'm looking for for every kid who comes through confirmation at Corinth. Ella wrote, Jesus loves me so much that he left heaven where he was praised, worshipped, and loved to come down to earth where no one liked him. Jesus was made fun of, spit on, mocked, and not taken seriously. Jesus is fully human and fully God. Jesus took all the sin from us and swapped it with his perfectness. And Jax wrote, God hates sin. He could not even look at his own son when Jesus died on the cross. He had so much weight 
carried on his back, and it was all of our sin. All we can do when we sin is ask for forgiveness, and he will forgive us over and over again. And all God's people said, and they all said, bring Paul up. Can we all agree that I don't need to say anything? That was amazing. Randy, you got a preacher on your hand, so do you, uh, Wes. At the risk of getting really heady, we're going to kind of delve into some doctrine. We'll delve into some doctrine because in this day and age, we will do anything, and when I say we, I mean collectively as a people, believers and non-believers alike, to think that we can somehow make ourselves right by the deeds that we do. Uh, there's a huge movement in the secular society, and it's called Good Without God. And the whole idea is like, you know, it, you know they, had the, they had a whole rally on the national, uh, national lawn uh, a few years ago. And it's this whole idea of, you know, why, why do we need God to be good? Can't we just do good? Can't we just be good? And, and then the, the, the underlying is, because that's what will make us good. If we do good, that's what will make us good. And that has always been a part of the church. It's always kind of filtered its way in. Now, we're not talking about once you accept Christ, you know, then you can just live however you want to. That's a different subject. But the thing that we've got to come to first is just this one idea, that there is no such thing as redemptive morality. There is no such thing as redemptive moralism. And redemptive moralism is this idea that I can do deeds that will somehow make me right whether it's right in general or right with God. And if you look at what the author of Hebrews is doing, he is coming to a group of people that used to have an old covenant, that had the old covenant, and during that old covenant, the old covenant was based on the law. It was, will you keep this law? And so if you think about it, how did that look? How did, how did, the, how did the keeping of the old covenant look? Well, first of all, the covenant was read to the people, you know, and choose this day whom you will serve, all this kind of stuff. And the God said, you know, through Moses, will you... Will you obey this covenant? Will you keep this covenant? And the people said, we will. But also think about the language of the Ten Commandments. If, you, if you're like me and you memorized it in the, in the King James, it's thou shalt not this, and thou shalt this, and thou shalt not this, and thou shalt. And so this idea of like, well, it's somehow, this, I'm, I've got to do something somehow to make myself right. But in the New Covenant, there's no such thing as redemptive moralism. And so look right here at just the language and the way the language changes, and it starts in verse 8. But in verse 8, this is Jeremiah 31, 31, and he's beginning to talk about what the new covenant is going to be like. And in verse 8, notice it says this, God says, and I will do this. I will make a new covenant with them. I will write my laws upon their hearts. I will remember their sins no more. Where do you show up in this? Where's your part in it? Where are you? Where are you in verses 8 through 13? The only part that you're in there is like you, you get his law on your heart and he remembers your sin no more. And you get to be his people. And so for us, any time that we think we do any good deeds that somehow add to our acceptability or somehow make us more worthy of salvation or somehow make us more worthy of acceptance to God, we've got to remember there is no such thing as this redemptive moralism. The only thing that redeems us in this new covenant is the blood of Jesus Christ. It is fully God's plan, fully his initiative, fully his power, fully his sacrifice, fully his work. And that's it. We don't add anything to it. And that's why I brought up the Isaiah 64, 6 earlier. We do, our good deeds that we do are absolutely wonderful. The good deeds, the moral deeds we do, they hopefully flow out of a life of gratitude that we have because we have been saved. They flow out of the fact that now we are imprinted with God's holy nature, which we'll talk about in a minute. They flow out of the idea that we have been saved and we're living a life where we are denying ourselves, taking up our cross and following Jesus. That's where they flow from. But if we look to put those on the scale of them making us right with God to obtain salvation, we're wrong. They're just filthy rags is what Isaiah says. Now think about this. I went to the Children's Museum in Rocky Mount when I was at the ripe age of about six or seven years old, and they had these things called puffy stickers. Anybody from my era remember puffy stickers? 
And I got a whole sheet of them about this big of Spider-Man puppy stickers. Which was great because Spider-Man's primary two colors are blue and red. And my dad had a 65 red Mustang. So I thought to myself, do you know the best place for these puffy stickers to go? All over that thing. He didn't, it wasn't the daily driver. The Dodge Dart was our daily driver. That was, we were rolling heavy in Rocky Mount. So I went out to the garage and only on the passenger side, because that was the side that didn't have the ping pong table on the other side of your garage. You know how it's like. And I just covered the side of that beautiful 65 Mustang which, by the way, someone drove into the beach, so it's rusted all underneath when you drove, so it wasn't like it was a show car. But I plastered those things on it because I said, you know what this 65 Mustang needs is Spider-Man stickers. And the minute I got home, my dad <laughs> immediately, Bah! you know, and I mean, it's a great memory for Father's Day, by the way. Why? You don't add stuff to something that's already perfect. You won't add anything to it. Similarly, we do, good, we do our good deeds because it's who God has made us in his new nature. It doesn't add anything to our acceptability. That work is complete on the cross. And again, that's where we come back to salvation is grace plus nothing. The second thing is that the new covenant is new to you because you are new through and through. The new covenant is new to you because you're new through and through. Now, when it says new, the new covenant, new does not refer to time. New in the Greek refers to newness. Same way if you, you know, you went out and you said, oh, I can go, I can go drive in the snow. I've got new tires. They're new in quality. Yeah, I mean, this shirt is perfect. It doesn't have any stains on it because it's new. This tennis racket just hits whack right back because the strings are new. And so the part that is beautiful is that the old covenant declared God's holiness and it also demonstrated our sinfulness. But the old covenant did not release any power for people to obey it. It, it, it shows you this is God's standard. This is how holy God is. And when you look at that standard and who you are, you go, well, I certainly don't measure up. So it's, it's God's holiness and our sinfulness but the old covenant didn't empower people to obey. But the new covenant is different. The new covenant is totally different. The new covenant imparts us with a new divine nature and grace for when we fail. A new divine nature and grace for when we fail. So verse 10, I love it. It says this, but this new covenant I will make with the people of Israel on that day, says the Lord, I will put my laws in their minds so they will understand them and I will write them on their hearts so that they will obey them. I will be their God and they will be my people. I love, I love that because it's this idea of God's covenant is not out there somewhere, not written on stone somewhere. God's covenant is now written in here. And the thing that occurred to me as I was writing the sermon is God's new covenant is redemptively invasive. God's new covenant is redemptively invasive. It's not out there somewhere. It's in here. It penetrates. It comes in. Paul's going to talk about this in 2 Corinthians 5, 17. He says, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, they are a new creation. The old is gone and the new has come. And so when God is saying through Jeremiah, now as the author of Hebrews is reinterpreting, this new covenant wasn't out there. Now it's going to get put in here and there will be a new divine nature that will help you obey foreshadowing the Holy Spirit, of course. And then we get to the very last verse there in verse 12, and I will remember their sins no more. Grace for when we fail. But you're going to ask the question, I get it. I've been a Christian for a long time and I still sin. Are you sure this new covenant thing is working? Now listen, I want to tell you something that God has given us. Free will. He gave us free will. He also gave us freedom to obey and to disobey. So whenever you and I, as a born-again believer, sin, that's not the new divine nature failing. That's you rejecting it. You still have the freedom and the ability to do that. It doesn't mean it's not there. It doesn't mean it's not there. 
The new divine nature is definitely there, and we know it through the power of the Holy Spirit living in us. Sometimes we call it our conscience, and you can do things to deaden your conscience, but that doesn't mean it's not there. The question is, you have this new divine nature within you because the law is now written on your heart and your mind. Are you asking it for help? Are you asking him as the Holy Spirit for help? I just taught kids sailing at a camp for, for a few years. Sending kids loose in a sailboat is one of the scariest things ever. There are, like, a canoe, you got to paddle. Man, shoot. First thing you know, you know sailing is going to be a problem when somebody asks you to grab the sheet and it has nothing to do with the bed. The sheet is a rope. You know a pirate came up with that. It had to have been. But, you know, you got all these ropes dangling. You got this part of the bottom of the sail that's called a boom. And the reason they call it a boom, I think, is because when it busts you upside the head, it goes boom. Then there's a rudder and there's a center board. There's a dagger board if you're in a little small. Man, you, you can see, you'll, I would be sitting in there and I'm teaching these kids this stuff. And we've got this video from 1972, you know, and Robin Williams is you know, sailing or whatever. And you go through all that with them and then you go, all right, now here's the sailboat. And man, I, it, it's amazing that they mostly came back alive, most of them. But what would really happen would be when there was just a complete and utter failure and the kid had gotten knocked out of the boat by the boom hitting them and they can't put the center board down and they're wondering why with the rubber up out of the water wondering why the steering's not working and the sheet is just dangling and wrapping around their necks and hanging them all to the side. And if I say, I'm going to get off the shore and I'm going to get in this little boat with you and I'm going to be there with you. And then all of a sudden we're tacking into the wind. And we're harnessing the wind and we're flying around and there's confidence and they're doing it. I'm like, now you take the rudder. Now you take the sheet. Now you make sure that we're hanging out the side. And because I'm in there with them, it's a whole different ball game. And this new covenant, God is not out there. He's in you. He's with you. And the last part is this. You can ask why. Why did God do it this way? Ask why. Sure, ask why. But don't let the why keep you from saying, yes, please. Ask the why. Because you know what? When we're meeting with staff this week, I, I thought to myself, you know, I've been a Christian for 40-some years. And I've been a pastor for 25, 7, 8, 20, how many, how many years it's been. And I still just kind of go, God, why would you do it this way? Why thousands of years ago did you give your law to people who you knew were going to fail it, who weren't going to be able to do it, and wow, guess what? They did fail it. And then you turned around after this time of prophesying that there was going to be a Messiah, and then you did give a Messiah. God, why'd you do it that way? Why? Why didn't you just do it this way with Jesus from the first? Why? It's okay. It's all, it's all right to ask why. Why all the sacrifices? Why the laws? Why the temple? Why all that? But I want to give you a few things. Why did God do it this way? First one is this. It might take a long time for an infinite, eternal God to reveal himself to stubborn people. It might take a really long time for an infinite, eternal God to reveal himself to stubborn people. Two, it might take a really long time for people to grasp how helpless they are in their sins. That they can't keep the law. That they can't do it. That they're utterly helpless. And third, and this is where Bob and I were landing this, this past week. Third is... If you're an eternal, almighty God, you get to do it however you want. You get to do it however you want. So rather than sit on the why, rather than just sit on the why, grab the offer for eternity. If, if about, you know, six months into dating Danielle, I just became really philosophical and just sat there on a rock looking out on the Blue Ridge Parkway and went, why does she love me? Why? I'm not leaving this place until I figure out why she loves me the way that she does. Some older gentleman would come along and say, while you're sitting there wondering why, you might just want to go ahead and ask her to marry you. Don't let that ship leave the harbor. Don't let that train leave the station without you. Now we can ask why, and you can ask why along the way, but don't let why keep you from saying yes, please. Yes, please. The offer through the new covenant is God living in you, with you, remembering your sins no more, giving you a new divine nature to help you obey him and forgiving you when you fail.
it's better. It's better with Jesus, and the life that he's come to give you is better. Let me pray for us. Jesus, forgive us for all the ways that we try to make ourselves holy, which don't. And we rely on ourselves rather than relying on you. Lord God, work in us, move in us. Remind us that this whole new covenant was your idea, your work, your sacrifice, your power, your goodness. And let us praise you. Lord, let our good deeds flow out of a life of gratitude that we live because we are so overjoyed that we've been saved in spite of our sins. It's in your incredible name we pray. Amen. Thank you so much, Paul. I just love preaching with that guy. Love his the way he spins a story and brings it home. So uh, this year we had 26 young people in our confirmation class. 24 of them were able to be with us two weeks ago. Two of them were unavailable for that service. And so there are two parts to confirmation, and confirmation is incomplete without both parts. There's the personal part where they make a personal decision to follow Jesus. They write about that. They meet with the pastor one-on-one. And then there's the public part. So it's not really done until they confess their faith publicly. So I'm going to invite Ella and Jax to come and stand beside me uh, for their public confirmation of their faith. And we do this a couple of different ways. And the first couple of ways we do it, you're going to join us. So on the words, on the screen will be the words to the Apostles' Creed. We're going to turn around and read them with you. Uh, Is my mic on? So we're going to turn around and read them with you. Would you stand, please, as we affirm our faith in the words of the Apostles' Creed? I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only begotten Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. You may be seated. So they also learn uh, question one of the Heidelberg Catechism because there are only two of them. We're going to say it together, and actually you're going to say it with us. And guys, while they're looking to see if you really know it, you can look out there like your sister or Lincoln or somebody else, and you can say, like, do they still know this or not? So you're testing them while you're at the same time they're testing you, okay? See if they're looking at the screen or looking at us because we got this, right? All right, all together, everyone, what is your only comfort in life and in death? that I belong, body and soul, in life and in death, not to myself, but to my faithful Savior, Jesus Christ, who at the cost of his own blood has fully paid for all my sins and has completely freed me from the dominion of the devil, that he protects me so well that without the will of my Father in heaven, not a hair can fall from my head. Indeed, that everything must fit his purpose for my salvation. Therefore, by his Holy Spirit, he also assures me of eternal life and makes me wholeheartedly willing and ready from now on to live for him. Thank you. All right, the very next thing we do in uh, confirmation service is some prayer. So you guys are going to pray first, I'm going to pray second, and then they're all going to pray for you. Your part's really easy. You can turn around. The words are on the screen, and I will read it with you. So together, you're going to pray the prayer of uh, consecration. O God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, I give myself to you as your own, to love and serve you faithfully all the days of my life. Amen. All right, I'm going to pray for you guys. Would you all join me? God, thank you so much for uh, the gift of these children. Thank you for the seeds that have been planted in their lives by friends and family and church. And we pray that you would continue to surround them with wonderful um, sources of of good influence. We pray that you would help them to make great choices and that they would only learn to love you and serve you more and more deeply throughout their years. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, church, it is your turn to pray for our confirmands. It is a prayer that we have been praying over many, many confirmands over many, many years. The words are on the screen. I invite you all to pray with me. 
Almighty God, who through Jesus Christ received these servants into the church, forgave their sins, and promised them eternal life, increase in them the fruit of your Holy Spirit. Grant love for others, joy in serving you, peace in disagreement, patience in suffering, kindness toward all people, goodness in evil times, faithfulness in temptation, gentleness in the face of opposition, and self-control in all things. Thereby strengthen them for their ministry in the world. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, who taught us to pray, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. As each uh, of our confirmands' name is read, I'll uh, warn you in advance, but it's kind of obvious, I think, in the order. So if you're one of their people, so that means parents, grandparents, siblings, friends, someone who's taught them in Sunday school, their confirmation partner, if you've been a part of the journey that has brought them to this place, would you stand as we confirm each one? So we'll begin with Ella. Would Ella's people please stand? O oh God, our Father, through Jesus Christ, you have accepted this, your servant, Ella McCall Barkley, into your family. Nourish her in the power of the Holy Spirit that she may walk blamelessly before you all the days of her life. And God's people said, Amen. Thank you. And Jax's family? O oh God, our Father, through Jesus Christ, you have accepted this, your servant, Jax Ryan Sane, into your family. Nourish him in the power of the Holy Spirit, that he may walk blamelessly before you all the days of his life. And God's people said, Amen. Please stand. You all may be seated. And you guys stand right here next to me. Pastor Amy has a Bible for you. So we have one more surprise question for you. Ready? All right, so the question is, do you promise to participate regularly in the life and mission of this local church as we help people become disciples of Jesus Christ by sharing the good news, worshiping God, loving others, learning from the Bible, and serving in God's world? If so, please answer, I promise with the help of God. All right, so congregation, you have heard their promises. Would those of you... In the congregation, please stand and join me as we welcome them into our church family. All together, we welcome you with joy in the common life of this church. We promise you our friendship and prayers as we share the hopes and labors of the Church of Jesus Christ. By the power of the Holy Spirit, may we continue to grow together in love and be witnesses of our risen Savior. Dr. Shirley Huffman is the president-elect of our consistory. Ella, Jax, uh, it's my privilege uh, on behalf of Corinth Reformed Church to officially, formally welcome you as full members to this body of Christ. I also want to really commend you. You've worked very hard. Uh, this process of confirmation is uh, really um, grueling at times, so congratulations on that. Also, I want to say that we as this body have really appreciated sharing in your public profession of faith. That's an important moment for you, and it's important for us as well. I do want to say, too, that we, uh, my prayer is that we will be a safe and nurturing place for you as you continue to learn what it means to be part of the body of Christ. And as you grow in your knowledge 
of who God is and what it means to live in the kingdom of God. So congratulations from your church on your full membership. So shall we? We're going to close our service with a Father's Day hymn, or it was chosen for Father's Day. You'll notice that the use of fathers in this hymn is really a metaphor. It's not so much about a biological dad as it is about our nation's founding fathers, actually. It's a patriotic hymn that was written by an Episcopal priest named Daniel Crane Roberts. And close your ears for a moment. He had fought for the North in the Civil War, but he, he wrote this prayer of thanks and petition for the centennial of the Declaration of Independence, and it was first widely sung at the centennial of the United States Constitution. So it's a reminder that both in times of celebration and in times of peril and conflict, we need to turn to the God of our fathers. Let's sing together. Friends, thank you again for worshiping with us today. I pray that something the Holy Spirit has used to touch your world and your life. Congratulations especially to Ella and Jackson. If you will walk with me toward the back, we're going to let everybody congratulate you individually as they go out today. And then we'll come up here and get some pictures after that. That work for y'all? So uh, meanwhile, the, the, uh, the letter of Hebrews closes with a blessing that we're using each week. And it's my prayer and my blessing for Jax and Ella and for all of us. Would you read it with me together? 
Now may the God of peace, who through the blood of the eternal covenant brought back from the dead our Lord Jesus, that great shepherd of the sheep, equip you with everything good for doing his will. And may he work in us what is pleasing to him through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. Go in peace.